So the village of Sayward respectfully acknowledges that we are gathered on the unceded territory of the Comox First Nation, the traditional keepers of this land. We'll call the meeting to order. Introduction of late items, CAOs. Nothing. Okay, good. Everybody's good with the agenda. We have an amendment to the agenda. Um, item seven under correspondent. No, under. Council reports. Number seven C. Is being removed. So the agenda as amended. Everybody's good with. Solids, thank you. Almost missed it. So close. Uh, minutes of previous meeting recommend a resolution that the minutes of the regular council meeting held on January 3rd, 2022 be adopted. Motion, please. I'll move that. Second. I'll second that. Discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none. Carried. Petitions and delegations. We have to we have Mr. Craig Nielsen, is that correct? Right. Hey, regarding the public nuisance bylaws. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, the sound will come through for the recording and not to the public, so to speak. I guess I am, yes. I've never spoken to Mike before. <laughs> Lots of times in front of a classroom. Um, it, the, I heard the council was considering changing the noise bylaw to create a medical exemption for generators. Is that true? Go ahead, Councillor Tinsley. There was a number of points of your microphone. It was, as I as I recall, there was a number of points of discussion. Uh, that was a point in various discussions, and nothing was really pursued. Yeah, I Jerry. I reviewed the uh, the uh, minutes from the seventh of January, tenth of January, whatever, whenever that meeting was, and I I remember hearing that, and that's what I wanted to speak about. Okay. There is um, a lot of science based out there that uh, emphasizes the importance of people's ability to sleep. And uh, I have no problem with people running their generators at night. However, they shouldn't be above a certain level. Um, I mean, if you're if you're not really considering this, I maybe I don't need to uh, you know go through this whole presentation and and tell you all about it. I mean, uh, do you understand, for example, how the uh, decibel system works? Oh yes, you would. You're a musician. Well, not not from my own personal knowledge, but the 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 information you put together that you brought is very thorough, yeah. and I, I believe all councils had a chance to read it. So we we've learned a lot from the information. Thank you. Yeah, good. Uh, uh, that's what the uh, purpose was. Yes, Scott. Yeah, I read uh, everything that uh, you sent in, and it's great. Uh, Forty-five decibel levels is the recommendation from the World Health Organization. Well. To sleep, they recommend somewhere around 30 or maybe 33 decibels in your in your bedroom. Uh, the World Health Organization and most uh, urban municipalities have have picked 45 decibels as a level for nighttime noise at the property line uh, because of, I guess they assume that by the time it gets into your house and into your bedroom, that's approximately what what you're going to be. I mean, it's going to vary by house and so on. Yes. And it's also important to know too, just like the Richter scale for earthquakes, the decibel level scale goes up tenfold, correct? Exactly. It's a logarithmic scale. So 
an increase from 40 to 50 decibels is 10 times louder. Uh, an increase from 40 to 60 decibels is 100 times louder, and so on. Okay, so we'll just hold off on the questions. And no, let the gentleman do the presentation, and then we'll do the questions after the end of the presentation. No, I, okay. I'm an instructor, or I was for you know over 30 years. I I appreciate questions and interactions. It means you're still awake, and I haven't lost you somewhere. It, it's fine, and then it doesn't throw me. Away. Okay, so it doesn't matter. Either way, um, I I can answer your questions afterwards too. Um. The main thing is sleep is extremely important. We, we, we all know that. I think, I think we can all agree on that. And it's because uh, just story. We were talking about these. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that, that, I should get my sleep. Oh, I left my phone in my coat. Sorry. No, don't waste my sleep. Um, Just uh, being awake and, and using your brain, uh, there's a, a, a compound that builds up in your brain called uh, beta amyloids. And when you go to sleep, when you go into deep sleep, which you do every night, hopefully for about an hour or more, your brain flushes all of that out. Uh, it's kind of unfortunate, but you go into deep sleep very early in the night. And so if that gets disrupted, most times you don't go into deep sleep. And that's one of the reasons why, well, we have these noise bylaws and we can't, uh, you know, allow noise at night. Um, I don't know what else I want to tell you. I mean, if you don't clear the beta amyloids out of your brain, it has been scientifically linked to uh, neurological uh, disease particularly Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's, and other neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, definitely not a, uh, an ideal situation. Um, I guess the other thing I would say is best policies, best bylaws are always the simplest. Uh, no exclusions are better. Uh, uh, I don't see a problem with the bylaw as it exists. If you want to clarify it more, uh, create a limit for nighttime noise at the property line, like uh, places like Edmonton and Surrey and virtually every other uh, urban municipality, a uh, large urban municipality has. I mean, uh, I would be okay with that. It's a very easy thing to check. Your phone, you can just go and download an app. Most of them are free or lots of them are free. You can you can spend a little bit of money, a dollar, and get a better one. And it's very easy to check your, uh, your sound levels. Um, other than that, I mean, if you went through all this, this stuff that we put together, uh, well, you already know everything that I wanted to uh, to say to you. I just wanted to come and you know answer any questions that you might have, and uh, you know make sure that we're we're clear on this. Yeah. So, so when I met you the first time when I was campaigning, um, you were discussing uh, the generator issue with me then. And uh, do you have um, any uh, statistics on on your neighbor's generator that uh, you're uh, allegedly having the issue with at that time? Do you take your phone app and measure at the, the your property line? No. Actually, we haven't had any power outages recently, and so I haven't actually done that. Mm -hmm. uh, Just to give an idea, the generator is rated. You put it in the field, open area, go 25 feet away. Uh, it is supposed to create 65 decibels, which is significantly more than is really uh, allowed. 
unfortunately, the generator is right between our houses, only three feet from from their house, and uh, the sound not only comes off the side of the generator, but it echoes off the side of the house and and reflects back up, you know, to our place. Have you had a discussion with your your neighbor regarding that or sound levels? Just oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Through the chair. Okay. <clears throat> That's fine. Okay. Uh, so else? Um, one question I have: I'm, most of the, um, as you mentioned, the larger municipalities have that down to 40 45 and that's part of their bylaw yeah by the larger municipalities uh some of the smaller uh rural areas like uh tassas sabellus and us um larger municipalities are generally not afflicted with the power outages as often as our small communities are uh including camel river uh, they're they're definitely do not suffer the same affliction as we do on a regular basis. So, but most of all, what I read in here, and correct me if I'm wrong, is on major municipalities. We put those in there because those ones are the most explicit. I spent about two hours on Google and I, I, I looked at uh, urban municipalities all across and all around Western Canada of various sizes, big ones and small ones. Smaller the municipality, uh, the more generalized the uh, noise bylaw is. It's very much like ours. It prohibits dogs. It prohibits uh, construction noises before 7 a.m. and after 8 p.m. Uh, and other than that, you know, it's there's not much there. So your suggestion, correct me if I'm wrong, is that we put in the bylaw between that 40 and 45, um, but how would you, and put some type of muffling system yeah, on can. the generators because of those people that are gonna run it all night for either heat or medical equipment. Is that correct? There are other ways, there are other ways to deal with, with, with heat or medical equipment. I mean, it's not like it's so cold here that uh, your house loses that much heat overnight from say eight o'clock or 10 o'clock. Well, I think there's some people that are going to beg to differ on that. Oh, okay. but what about what about sure. medical equipment? But, but I guess the, the thing comes down to you're going to try to make a bylaw to benefit some people that is obviously to the detriment of others. Okay. You know, and that's I understand that is, where you're that is not right. I mean, I can't do anything about my neighbor's uh, generator and her noise. And that her noise. Is no, sorry, ma'am. Please. It, it, it's, it's, it's like, I mean, there are ways. And uh, when uh, we first uh, com noise complaint that uh, was sent in, uh, and in the last newsletter, it was pointed out that there are ways to mitigate the noise. And you can, there's a company called Second Skin. They sell two inch thick blankets, Velcro together, you put it over top of your generator. It's supposed to lower the noise level by, oh, they figure 15 to 17 decibels. Um, there are other ways to do it, you know, uh, sound absorption on on the wall that reflects yeah i was just trying to understand um you know clarification on what you were asking all i'm asking is that uh, that i get to sleep at night okay okay you well, know and, thank you and however however you can manage that that's fine and i mean i i commend your your uh compassion for people with medical needs but you know, we all have medical needs. I mean, most of the people in this town are are seniors, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, somebody else's medical needs are no greater than their neighbors. So, I mean, what you've got to do is you've got to you've got to work out some sort of a balancing act 
that's going to take into consideration all of these things. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Poulsen. Sue. I would, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I would um, thank you for your report. And um, I found it quite interesting that it was written from a metropolitan point of view um, and considering that we are remote and we are more um, likely to have power outages. When those power outages happen, um, it's usually in the winter and we are, um, people are dependent on their wood stoves on their generators and on their candles and that sort of thing. So as Sayward has moved forward, a lot more people have got have gotten the generators that do make automatic whole house generators more noise. But the generator that we had before we got um, an automatic generator, it sounded like a tank and um, but my point is that we use the generator only in an emergency and um, in some cases those emergencies last for three or four or five days. Sure. In other times, yeah. in other times they last two hours, four hours, part of a day, part of a night. And so I think um, we also need to consider the um, our location and the um, the need for working a generator during emergencies and also uh, for the medical conditions I think um, you know you say that everybody is entitled to a good night's sleep and so we should keep our generators off or at a 45 40 40 40, I'll put 45 decibels yeah. at your property. Yeah. But for somebody that is reliant on a CPAP or a, a ventilator or something, they're not going to be able to sleep if they don't have that machine running. So some people's cases are um, more emergent than others. And um, the reason we run our generator at night is for the person to be able to to breathe and and sleep so um there are, it's a real difficult situation in a remote area like this and it's it just seems like um what, what are you going to do with the person next to you that snores so loud that it's above 40 decibels <laughs> that keeps you awake you know so i i think i hope that we can find some common ground here and common um uh common sense so that we're we're helping to meet the needs of everybody um and i mean i've lost a few nights sleep and it's not pleasant, but um, you you never fully recover. Well, I I I'd question that because I can I can find you a scientific paper if you would like, yeah, but it, yeah. you just anyway anyway never there, require, yeah, yeah but right. you never but, fully yeah recover. so but uh, I mean I don't think it's the time to for us to debate it but um, the, there are other alternatives though for. Uh, something like a CPAP machine. Uh, I have a friend who lives in northern Saskatchewan and they get at least as many uh, <coughs> power outages there and for at least as long. He uses a 12 volt car battery to power his uh, his uh, CPAP machine. Uh, my friend's mother was uh, dependent on an oxygen concentrator. Uh, they lived on a farm. Uh, power outages happen all the time. She had a battery backup, fairly large battery backup, cost a couple of hundred dollars and kept her oxygen machine plugged into that. And it would keep it running long enough to, uh, you know, that she didn't have to worry about it. There are other ways for people to work around this. People with medical conditions 
deal with them. I have no way of dealing with, you know, uh, a neighbor that is too loud that, you know, that is disrupting my sleep. Okay. Councillor Tinsley, last point. Uh, I just wanted to summarize, as I understand. Your microphone, please. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to summarize, as I understand the key message here and, and a lot of good research here is that this isn't about stopping generator use for no. any form of electrical. This is about the fact that there is technology available to control the level of generators to when they're being run uh, that's available and also that other communities use it. Um, that seems to be in summary the message and that should be considered as a council debates it further. Correct. Okay, okay. thank you Absolutely. very much. Uh, the only other thing I would say is don't discount this as a as a as a rural area or you know we're out in the in the sticks. We are an urban area. My house, my neighbor's house is you know 25 feet that way. I have another house that's on the other side of me that's 15 feet. It's very close, you know, cheek to jowl, so to speak, in the village here. Uh, out in the valley. You know, it doesn't matter. You've got you know a couple of bakers. You're nowhere near your neighbor, but it's important when you're close to people that you uh, consider everyone. Thank you very much, Mr. Nielsen. Thank you. Have a good night. Okay. Correspondence. Recommendation that A through C be received. Motion, please. I'll move that. Second. I'll second that. Discussion. All in favor? Sorry, do you have a point for discussion? No. Okay. Opposed? Seeing none, motion is carried. Council reports. We'll start off with Councillor Tinsley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Oh, sorry, CAO. Sorry, uh, we thought that would be restage motion, and then usually you go into a discussion motion. And there's a couple of things there that need at least oh. a very quick chat on. Okay, mm -hmm. very well. Yeah. You may, may. Councillor Tinsley. I'll get you to turn off your microphone, please. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. We have we have microphone issues. We yeah. do. Sometimes they beep, um, so I don't have to repeat that, right? Uh, no. Just to offer you a few comments, I made some comments here under under the very first item, but I would just want to mention that this letter from um, we think and we know it is from uh, Sayward Futures. It's not on Sayward Futures letterhead, and it hasn't been signed. I will say that we received one that was on Sayward Futures letterhead, but it was not signed. And in between that letter and this letter, um, we try to make sure that the letter that we got was uh, the right letter from Sabred Futures position, and we believe it is the right letter, but it still has not been signed. Does that make sense to you? Uh, sorry, take a step back. You only receive stuff that you should be on the letterhead of the organization it's sending to you, as well as signed by that organization so you know it's legitimate. Otherwise, anybody could get any kind of letterhead and slap a letter and, and give it Correct. to you, and you wouldn't know if you're dealing with the, the real thing. So we believe this is the the real thing. It's just not on the right letterhead and it's not been signed. Okie doke. Councillor Bouchette. Yeah, I'd just like to add that uh, I personally handed that letter in on letterhead to the office and it came right from the board of directors. So. Uh, I will make sure that if I hand it in personally, that they are signed in the future. Oh, thank you. And, and thank you. I just want to reemphasize that it was on the letterhead for some reason. I misplaced it. I couldn't find it. And that's why you see this. Uh, your CAO did follow up and find this one, but neither one of them was signed. But just so you know, that doesn't delegitimize it because I think we've got lots of evidence that this actually came from the board and it's approved by the board. Okay. Now, um, I will say that um, I think the response to it, uh, certainly pending uh, conversation by the council and direction given to you, sorry, given to us by you, uh, I still think it needs a staff report uh, because there's a little bit of history here. Uh, and I think that history would help with this particular discussion. 
So um, certainly staff's recommendation is to put it back to staff and we'll bring forward a, a fulsome report on past practices and some of the issues that we've encountered. So can we have a motion please for a staff report to be done on the correspondence letter from A from Sayward Futures? Motion please. I'll move that. Second. I'll second that. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, motion is carried. Okay, and is there any discussion on the AVICC resolutions that are CAO? We have not received anything back from uh, any council members on proposed resolutions at this date, and, and we don't have anything to provide to you. That's what I thought. Okay, thank you. Number seven. Councillor Tinsley, it is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the report is uh, fairly straightforward in front of you. Um, uh, both Councillor uh, Bruchette and myself attended with uh, our operations uh, manager, Tony, uh, to the location on uh, McMillan Road uh, Drive, sorry. Um, and just looking at possibilities for council's consideration uh, relative to uh, better water control in that area on a temporary basis till the village is able to move forward, hopefully in, in the next few years uh, on something else. Uh, and so there's four uh, different uh, ideas that were proposed there uh, that may or may not be useful in ensuring that when there is excessive uh, water uh, coming down from the treat area above, uh, which seems to be coming more common in many areas uh, worldwide, including here, that the owners are not in a last minute position uh, due to uh, water overflows at the uh, the actual McGlomon Drive area, particularly the three homes that are uh, uh, currently most affected when that occurs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, CAO Jarvis. Thank you. Um, only to say that um, since this report staff has um, been looking at some of the studies that have been completed about <clears throat> the drainage up on uh, McMillan and continue to um, investigate further and uh, just you know restating that we would appreciate some time just to be able to continue to gather um, gather further information for council's consideration. OK, so we um, will make a motion on a staff report regarding the drainage. Yes. OK, we have a motion um, on the investigation from the staff on the drainage, please. I'll move that. Second. I'll second it. Discussion. All in favor. Opposed. Seeing none. It is carried. OK, and B, Councillor Bruchette. Uh, you have a staff verbal report from the January 19th, 2023. My flags, sorry, CEO, is there something else to add or no? OK, Councillor Bruchette, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Is there a slide that has a PDF with the LIDAR imaging? Your microphone. OK, um, yeah, it was a, a great meeting. Uh, There's a couple presentations. Um, uh, first one was on LIDAR, which I found really interesting. Um, and, and LIDAR is light uh, and, and range, light detection and ranging. And uh, it uses lasers that pulse between a million and six million times a second, uh, penetrating the tree canopy, giving you a topographic readout. It allows you to uh, look at slope, uh, uh, stream flow. It can even identify rivers and streams that are fish bearing. So that was really interesting to me. And recently what uh, this technology has identified in the Sayward area is that we have one of the largest living Douglas fir trees on Vancouver Island. Um, previously, it was thought that uh, Carmana Walbrand had the largest Douglas fir at 96 uh, meters, um, but that one actually is not living, although it's still erect. Um, the one that we have here, uh, 10 minutes from the crossroads junction, is 90, 90, 94 meters tall, which is 308 feet, and it's still alive. So it's kind of cool that we found that we have the largest Doug fir here at Sayward. 
Um, a couple other things that uh, we picked up from the meeting. Um, there's going to be a harvest plan on uh, Stowe Creek, uh, Mount Coosum, and it possibly will interrupt. Uh, some of the trails for the Kusum climb. So there's uh, some issues regarding that that uh, will have to get worked out. Um, so that came to my attention. Um, and in the 2022, there were 1.37 million trees planted here in the North Island. So some stats on uh, future growth. Um, that's uh, about all from the LIDAR. We could probably use it for some of our flood mitigation uh, if we use that technology. The second presentation was uh, on the First Nations uh, sharing protocol with regards to their large cultural cedars. And a large cultural cedar can either be a red or a yellow cedar. And usually it has a uh, 100 centimeter, one meter uh, diameter at base height is what they would consider a large cultural cedar. And there's gradings of three types. Uh, the first is uh, your class one, and that's for large community canoes or large totem poles. Your class two large cultural cedar will be for medium totem poles and uh, regular canoes. And your third grading of large cultural cedars, uh, which is about 25% of them that are graded, are just usually for small totems. Now, out of uh, all the graded large cultural cedars in 2022, there's 324 cedars that were identified in all the cut blocks. And out of that, there was only uh, one that's been planned for harvest and uh, being uh, put forward to the First Nations. So that's my report from the meeting. Thank you. Any questions to Councillor Brichette? Anyone? Councillor Polson? Thank you. Um, I would just like to say that it's great that they planted over a million. What was the number? One million three hundred one million three hundred seventy thousand. Which is great for our um, carbon credits. So uh, you know it's it's to be a benefit to the forestry department, the forestry um, industry too, because they are replacing what they've cut down. So they're. Um, maintaining that uh, carbon neutrality. Yeah, um, from what I understood from my conference, uh, for every tree that the forest company cuts down, they plant three. So that's, that's very good. And it's a renewable resource, of course. So in 70, 80 years, when those trees are harvestable, it'd be much more. OK, so we got that. Uh, we don't need any motion on that, do we, to accept the reports? We can, we could. OK, so a motion to receive the verbal report from um, Councillor Tinsley and Councillor Brichette. I'll move we receive the reports. Thank you. Second. Anyone? I'll, I'll second that. Whoever's fastest. Okay. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none. Carried. Reports of committees? None. Mayor's report. Uh, just a quick verbal. I had an opportunity to go to my first TLA conference, which is the truck loggers conference, and that was I was sent through the SRD as um, because I am not overly familiar with forestry. It was um, an educational, you know, three days for me and a lot of information. Uh, regretfully, this year is a little gloom and doom in the industry. Um, hopefully things will turn around. But uh, it was, as I said, I mean, it's, it's a learning step for me because I'm not that familiar with logging. So luckily, um, Brad McKay from WFP took me under his wing and introduced me to a lot of ministers and a lot of people that are very knowledgeable in the forest industry that I can contact for information. So, Sid, unfinished business. None. Staff reports. Committee of the whole meeting, date change. Okay, um, CAO, did you want to speak to that? No. Nope. Okay, so the council received the committee as a whole meeting date change report. And 
that the Cal meeting planned for January 24th tonight and February 28th be moved to the 31st and the 14th respectfully. Respectfully. Do I have a motion, please? I'll move that. Second. I will second that. Discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none. Carried. Demographics and land based report December 2022. CAO, did you have any comments on that? Yeah, I just suggest it. it's a very good reading report. Lots of good information. It's a summary of uh, information on a stats can. You really don't want to get into stats and stuff. It's a mess. I think it's a mess. Um, very difficult to follow, but this is very good. It's a good summation. A summation. My suggestion is you, you, if you have a permanent uh, binder that you bring here, that you take that report out and you stick it in that binder because it is really good information. I believe that information actually should be in the mayor council office on a regular basis. Now, this is timely to have that report because we're coming up on budget and it shows the demographics and the people that we govern. Councilor Prashad. Yeah, I'd like to make note here on uh, page 73 of the report. Um, I think there's a few things that are missing that should be included in this uh, with regarding to uh, culverts that are missing in this uh, uh, for the stormwater. On page 75 again, uh, yeah, the culvert valve under the road out of the pond. It's missing uh, in the infrastructure, so I think that should be added because that is one of the trivial things that we'll possibly need to deal with. Okay. So, so I made some notes here and drew some circles of where it's missing. There's three pages in which the culvert uh, is non-existent in the infrastructure diagrams. Okay, so you'll go over that with the CAO? Yeah, I've got them flagged here so okay. we can look at that, but Thank it's you. really important that they're in there. Thank you. So the council received, discuss, and approve the demographics land based report from December 22nd. We'll go through more on discussion with uh, the CAO. So, do you have a motion on that, please? I'll move that. Second. I'll second that. Discussion, CAO. One of you. Uh, just a quick comment, if you wouldn't mind providing those copies to us, and what we'll do is we'll photocopy them and give them back to you. I think he was referring to after the meeting. Sorry, I, now it's good. No, that's fine. That's fine. That that's fine. That that pond is involved in the That's a storm drain. That has a valve that should be okay. actually. That's not existing. And I'm going to ask question. Yeah, it's just uh, I've got copies of just the other maps it's missing on, so. OK, same thing, but just different. OK, gotcha. Thank you. Councillor Paulson. Thank you. Um, on page 14, where it lists the household composition and says that um, it's been declining in Sayward, the 2.0 person per household average is smaller than the provincial average of 2.4. So I'm when I'm um, thinking about the water supply and I seem to remember that the water supply is based on a household of four. I you, don't recall that. Uh, uh, CAO, Prince? There's a number of numbers. That have number of numbers. So okay. your microphone's right. Uh, the one I remember is 356 people. So uh, not just a matter of how many in each household, but it's around 340 to 360 in that range is what our water system is, is geared for, but you're going to be receiving a report on that shortly next month or so. And that number will become clear, but it certainly isn't based on two people per house or four people per house. It's actually based on uh, the number of people in the village. That's yeah. OK, because I was hoping that if the numbers per household had gone down, that maybe we had more water available. Than... No. It's good hope though. OK, so that's all the discussion on that. Anybody have anything else? Good, so all in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, motion is carried. Now to the, um, sorry, CAO. 
Is there something to add? The, the, sorry, uh, the, the discussion we were having is um, are we approving it as presented or are we doing some amendments and um, so we yeah, we can't we can't approve it as amended because it hasn't been amended. Correct. So you're not approving it tonight. That's the, we're just receiving it. Correct. Right. OK, thank you. Sorry. Thank you. OK, now to something really important. Not that that's not important. Let me clarify. It's all very important. We're good. OK, C, the appointment CAO authorizing the signing authority to Lisa Clark, CFO and CO. And the recommended resolution is that Mr. Kier Jarvis be appointed as Chief Administrative Officer for the Village of Sayward, effectively January 16th, 2023. Do I have a motion, please? I'd happily move that. Second. Sorry, your microphone, please, Scott. Thank you. I'll second that. Discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, motion is carried. To the people in the audience, this is our, our new CAO, Kier Jarvis, who's come from Up Island and uh, started here on the 16th and is happily living at the uh, campsite for now. And then we're welcome and we're all very glad that he's aboard. Welcome. OK, and next is that council authorizes Mayor Mark Baker and Deputy Mayor Tom Tinsley and Chief Administrative Officer Kier Javis as Chief Financial and Chief Financial Officer Lisa Clark to be signing authorities and respecting municipal finance matters for the village of Sayward. Do I have a motion, please? I'll move that. Second. Councilor Paulson. Thank you. I'll second that. Discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Hearing none, motion is carried. Campground rental space. CAO 2023. Recommended resolution that council receive the campground rental space CAO 2023 report. Do I have a motion, please? I'll move that. Second? I'll second that. All in favor? Discussion. Whoops, missed that. All in favor? Opposed? See none. That's carried. And the council approves a monthly campground rate of $350 for the CAO for 12 consecutive months ending, ending January 24th, after which time the rate will be reviewed by council. Do I have a motion, please? I'll move that. Second. I'll second that. Discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, motion is carried. E, Green and Exclusive Community Building, GICB Grant Application 2023 Report. Mr. France. Um. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, this is a funding uh, opportunity that was uh, found for us by one of our consultants. Um, it's a good opportunity because I'm pretty sure council knows the state of this building. It's old and there's a lot of things in it that need fixing. And I think a lot of things that can be brought up to uh, the standards of, of uh, electrical consumption and, and heating the building. The council's got some recommendations on file saying we should be looking for alternatives. And this provides you with that opportunity. A um, little bit tight on the funding because it's only an 80% grant, and I'm going to say it's also a very rough estimate at 900,000. I started adding up the numbers, and I got to 800. And then when you start adding in consultants and engineering, it's it's going to be more. But it's very clear that we have a lot of good support uh, reports that are already done by way of uh, asset management reports and also an electrical study. Um, there are other components to this uh, uh, grant that will require 
uh, some expertise that we don't have. That's namely the energy consumption and greenhouse gas uh, savings by going to these uh, changes. So that's why we need the help. Um, so yes, it's a good opportunity. It's good timing. If we can get this, it'll really help the center. Uh, one question for you. It's uh, 80 80 percent funded. Where would the other 20 come? I've given you a couple ideas here. Um, uh, <laughs> one is to uh, suggest to the area director that since their residents uh, use 60 percent of our attendees here are from his area, that we look for a one time grant of some sort. Um, I know you're smiling. I, I get it. Uh, we've also got uh, 43,000 in the local government climate action program that could be used. And I think, uh, and, and I'm not really emphasizing this too much, but obviously if you shut down, it's not open and there'll be some sort of savings there. Quantifying them is is uh, difficult, but I'm pretty sure that if the total thing is a million dollars, it's going to be very difficult to find uh, 200,000 bucks. But that doesn't mean you don't try. We'll have to figure, figure it out downstream. Or shall I say your new CAO will have to figure it out. I'll be very much looking forward to. Uh, no, I won't be. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Council received the Green and Exclusive Community Building Grant Application 2023 report. So, this is just for a receipt. Motion, please. I'll move that. Second. I'll second that. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, carried, and that council directs staff to contract with Urban Systems to complete the application for seven thousand dollars plus disbursements. Uh, well, when you receive, you're just receiving the report. This is where we get into discussion. I'll move that. This is the first day we've had the mics. Apologize. We have. <laughs> okay, we have a second on that, please. I'll second that. Discussion. Councillor Tinsley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, I appreciate um, our small village, like any small village, is, is always interested in free money, but there'll be a cost to it. Um, the uh, like in terms of the consultant. Uh, just the whole big picture with the Kelsey Center. Granted, we don't want it to keep going, but the investment of this amount of money in a, a facility that's still there's lots of considerations going around the financial viability of the facility. That facility. So I just bring that forward as is that a consideration at all in in uh, moving forward? Um, CAO, did you want to jump on that? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This oh, okay, well, glad I asked. The consideration, all the considerations are on the table. So if we can get the grant and we can get the SRD's backing on the grant application, it would make sense of that because considering some of the options that may be available down the line. So that part, I know I'm being a little vague. But I'm sure you understand why. All in favor. Sorry, now, now you want to speak? I, well, because I, I thought it deserved a council discussion and I wanted to hear that first. But if you're finished with that discussion, I got a couple of words I could give to you. Sure. I think you're absolutely right. There are other things that uh, are going to require uh, effort and money to make the building whole. Any building requires a substantial amount of upkeep as you go, and this building is no different. But I think these funds take a major element of, of that away and, and solve the problems of HVAC units, uh, savings, uh, electrical, plumbing, and uh, windows, a whole gamut of different things. And again, you, you'll get, uh, uh, well, you have received in the past, but uh, sorry, it's probably not here, uh, other reports that name all these things and I think they really fit well with the funding. It doesn't stop there. Any building is going to require more infrastructure, more fixes, but for now this is a major step forward. You you look at um, our propane bill, right? It was averaging 10,000 a month to heat this place 
if we can actually get something a little more efficient in there and cut that down to maybe, I don't know, even a third. That's huge savings to because of 10,000 a month to me, it's just mind boggling. I don't. Yes, but it's still that's a lot of coin. To be floating, OK. So did we have a motion on that? Everybody voted wrong. Nobody voted. Motion is on the table. Did we have a seconder? Let's do a seconder again. We had a seconder. We had the discussion, so we should move on to the vote. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, it is carried. And that the staff is the motion that the staff is directed to submit the application to the Infrastructure Canada. Do I have a motion, please? I'll move that. Second. I'll second that. Discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none. Carried. F is the Regional Grant Opportunity for UBCM Emergency Operations Centre. John France, CAO. I think it's a good opportunity to try and defray some of our costs. We know it's needed. It's in our budget. Um, so here's a, an opportunity to get some grant funding to uh, resolve at least one issue within the bar hall. And also the advanced drone training is equally uh, not well, maybe not equally, but it is important. Um, I mean, obviously having a generator for backup is pretty, pretty darn important for the fire hall. So yeah. yes, I've got nothing else to offer. Uh, good job by, um, I'm sorry, I, I really, I've said this to you before. I didn't write this report. This came from Sean and I think Tom, sorry, Councillor Tom. Sean. Yeah, okay, Sean. And he deserves the credit for chasing it down, not me. He's referring to uh, Sean Koopman from the SRD. For all those people out there that didn't know that. Okay, so that the report from the CAO he received. Do you have a, sorry, somebody. Do I have a motion, please? Anybody? Sorry, uh, Mr. France, could you turn off your microphone, please? Thank you. I'll move that. Second. I'll no, second that. Discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, carried. And that the part of the village and the ongoing work in relationship to emergency relation, pardon me, to emergency planning and the application for financial assistance under the community. Emergency Preparedness Fund 2023 Emergency Operational Center grant be authorized for submission to the UBCM in collaboration with the Strathcona Regional District. Do I have a motion, please? I'll move that. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, motion is carried. And that the village agrees to the Straff Corner Regional District submitting the application on their behalf. And if funded, agrees that Straff Corner Regional District managing the grant and being the recipient of all funding. Motion, please. I'll move that. Second. I'll second that. Discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, motion is carried. Island Cano uh, Island Canosa. Cannoli, hey, I want to get a cannoli. Buongiorno, okay. So, I'll, Island Coastal Economic Trust, ice tea, campground application 2023. Anything to add, CAO? Uh, the only thing I had to add uh, is I put a little history in the report and I had a little note for myself that it, you're the representative if you wanted to speak to Island Cannoli. <laughs> I, I personally do enjoy cannoli. <laughs> I do. It's that little bit of Italian that I do I have, and I know I appreciate it. I, I do, and, and I really, I, yeah, I do like it. Um, everybody's read the information. Anybody have any questions on the information? Councillor Tinsley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm I'm just a little unclear. This is a a future, uh, future camp ground improvement project, or has someone already been spent on this? No, this is future. This is future. Okay. Correct. See, oh, your microphone, sorry. 
Oh. This matches up with the 80% grant that we just applied for. So this is the other 20%. So we've actually got two campground grants going. One is 100% and the second one is an 80 and this completes the 80 with the 20. Nothing has been done yet though. Other than the application. Well, other than the application, no work has been. Yeah. And not this application. Okay. The other one. Okay. Councilor Burchette. And, and, and uh, that was the plans that we looked at a few meetings ago, correct? Thank you. Okay. So we have a motion. No, let's do a motion. Okay, motion is that uh, council receive the ICE-T campground application 2023 report. I will move that. Second. I'll second that. Discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, motion is carried. And the motion that the council direct staff to apply for the ICT grant and approves the contracting of urban systems to complete the application for $1,200. Do I have a motion, please? I'll move that. Second. I'll second that. Discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, motion is carried. Parcel tax and DCC report 2023. Mr. France. Uh, the, the first part of the report is basically a, a copy and paste from the provincial government site because I thought I did a good job in explaining what both these taxes were. So if you've got any questions on, on that part, um, both of them do require a fair amount of administration. So it's not just a matter of popping into place. Once it's in place, there's a lot of administration that involved with it. Um, on the parcel tax side of it, you have to have a parcel tax review panel every year, and you're putting it out as a bill every year to all, all residents, but you also have to base it on something. And that something is usually the amount of your capital plan plus reserve contributions. Now, I don't want to get an idea that there's a lot of money here. It's basically uh, a, a tax, uh, a parcel tax on those properties that have the water sewer running along front of it or have easy access to it, uh, but don't have improvements on it. Those properties have the benefit of that water sewer line. It's reflected in the price of that property when they try to sell it. So they get a benefit from it. And it's just right that they pay some sort of amount every year to the, um, uh, to the operations of the, now I gotta be careful, it's not operations, to the running of the of, of the water and sewer treatment. Typically, parcel taxes are used to pay for the capital and reserve contributions only. The operations fees, this is not in stone, but this is the way it usually works. The, op the operating fees that, that they pay as part of the user and, uh, sorry, water user and sewer user fees, that component is for the operations. So there is a little bit of delineation there, but it's not etched in stone and council can make decisions on that. So this is primarily to go to the the lots that are that do not have water and sewer okay, going to their homes, correct? All lots. So for instance, if, if your capital, uh, and this is very rough, if you had 100 properties and your capital program each year was say $20,000, each property would be paying 200 bucks times 100 properties that comes out to 20,000. It does. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. I'm just using that as an example, but that's basically the way it works. You'll have to decide each year. You might not collect the full amount because frankly, the capital may be huge and therefore the parcel tax may be just simply unaffordable, but there has to be some sort of process in place to manage it between user fees. Like from, from my perspective, the Sunshine Coast Regional District, it took us years to get to a point where there was a balance between uh, user fees and, and parcel taxes. And typically the parcel taxes were helping you pay for um, the user fees and vice versa in some years. So it's, again, it's not etched in stone. It allows you to collect money off of un, large undeveloped lots because there is a difference between a residential lot being so, so big and one that's capable of being Subdivided, they should be paying more because they have more of a benefit for that water sewer line. Uh, it only attracts it on those. And if you take a look at around the village, there's not a lot of empty lots. There are a bunch, but that's part of the study that you do before you implement. You you have to study that to find out exactly what you can attract. But I suggest it's probably several thousands of dollars, and at this point, every bit helps. Councillor Bruchette. 
Now, would that rate be uh, different for commercial properties as opposed to residential, like that big vacant commercial lot across the street? Um, the parcel tax can be based on area size. Uh, there's two types of doing this, right? There's parcel tax, which is basically an area tax. Um, there's also frontage. So the amount of line that you have running in front of, of a particular property. It gets a little complicated because you have pie shaped lots. It has a special calculation and you have what are known as panhandle lots, which is basically it only fronts the size of the driveway, but the lots in behind. So you have special calculations there. So the answer, short answer is yes, they, they would end up paying a parcel tax because uh, they benefit from, from it. But would they pay more? That's up to council. OK, now can it be where just the empty lots? Are being um, subject to the parcel tax? I don't think you can do that. No? I, I don't. Okay. I, I've never seen it done that way, but I don't think you can do that because if you apply a tax, you have to apply it uniformly across a range of the same type of property. You can't pick and choose which properties that the tax applies to. Yeah, I mean, to me, I thought maybe just because they're empty, that would be a certain type of property. Uh, if it's, it's owned residential and it's a residential lot, okay. it's in a class called residential, whether it's improved Those or not. Right. So what this is asking for, we'll get into is just to get more deeper into it for a staff report. One of the things that I caution is, you know, when we look at all this, we're looking that that's completely different from the taxes. And from the municipal taxes that we charge. So we'd be adding an additional tax. Go ahead, CEO. Uh, yep, yeah, yeah, so no, again, it depends on what council decides. It's a new layer of tax, but you, what you might do is say, uh, what's the calculation that keeps the addition of a parcel tax and the user fee the same charge for a residential. You could do it that way, but I mean, um, that's up to that final report to report out to you and you'll see the options and then make your decision from there. Okay. Uh, just a couple other little points. Under discussion um, on the report on page 133, I said both these methods will not provide a final solution to revenue resource shortfalls. I just want to emphasize right. that, but will may, PTs will and DCCs may, help in attracting much needed revenues. I think parcel taxes will because you're going to be attracting a property that currently pays nothing for water sewer. And I say DCCs may because if there's, in your opinion, if there's no properties here, I'll give you a good example. If Cooperton wanted to go ahead and uh, do their uh, subdivision, it would attract DCCs because now they're in process. You can't too late. charge them. And the same thing goes with the Adama property. But if there's other properties in town that you think can be subdivided, then DCCs are something to look at. DCCs are a lot more expensive to implement. Uh, I will tell you that uh, the, the cost for both parcel taxes and DCCs is, is well, DCCs is around $7,000, but we've got a lot of work to do on that yet from a staff perspective. And parcel, ta uh, sorry, the DCCs came in at $50,000, but I, I took a, I guess I took a bite out of them. And they came back with $27,000, but I think that even that is too high. Uh, we'll, we'll have to spend time on really uh, working with urban systems, if that's who we go with, to really narrow down exactly what we want from them, because I think their scope is too large right now, and I think we can find other ways of doing certain things to make the cost cheaper. Okay. It's still going to cost money, but we think we can do it. That's why you've got the recommendation saying intermediary steps so we can go back and work on. Right. But DCCs are a development cost. Those are the developer comes in, wants to do a subdivision. We're charging DCCs, DCCs which I think most communities and definitely most municipalities do have, do they not? I mean, a lot of the communities that I worked in had, if you call them offsite development fees, but basically DCCs. So that's charged strictly to the developer. Okay, so the current resolution is that the staff be directed to bring back a report to the cost analysis of a parcel tax, both for revenue estimates and administrative support. Details. Do I have a motion, please? I'll move that. Second? I'll second that. Discussion? 
Councillor Tinsley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I just want to be clear. So there's the analysis of the parcel tax and DCCs. They're separate. What we're looking at is that the parcel tax analysis, the, the cost and the whole administrative part of looking at that, uh, it's quite a bit lower and it can be mostly done internally. And that's all like that's that's clearly the only one we're looking at right now. Is that correct? As I see in the motion, it's only referencing the parcel tax. I want to use some uh, words uh, when you say mostly. Um, we want to analyze to see how much work is required. And that's what that report's going to do. We'll come back to you and say this is the workload and we'll tell you whether or not we can do it internally. I do know there's some things that we're going to need some outside help on. But um, again, we're we're just trying to assess that. Just so you know, it's not completely in-house. There are some things we're going to need help on. Sorry, your microphone, please. Sorry. Councillor Chesley. So, so the key message being that it's focused on just the parcel tax for exactly what they're. Thank you. I just needed to hear that. Thanks. See you, Jarvis. Yeah, the only other thing I'll add uh, <clears throat> further to what um, Mr. France indicated was we also wanted uh, to try to do some projecting about what the financial benefit might be. So the cost uh, uh, along with um, what opportunities are out there in the community to to leverage the tax against again some estimating. Thank you, Mr. Prince. I think Councillor Tinsley's comments accurately reflects. Uh, I just wanted to emphasize that we weren't saying no to DCCs. That's your decision. You have to got, uh, figure out if there is that kind of or what information you need to get to figure out whether or not there's enough subdividable land in the, in the village to make it worthwhile. And, and my thing is I. My opinion is I don't think there is. I think with the um, uh, Adama property going, uh, I think that takes up a large chunk of it. Now, whether or not stuff will go in the valley, I don't know. And that's why. Yeah, but well, you got that large thing. No, I'm saying. Millen. Yeah. OK. Any more, Dad? Nope, you're good. <laughs> Any uh, further discussion? Nope. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, carried. Code of Conduct Bylaw. Recommended resolution that uh, Council receive the Code of Conduct Bylaw. Staff report for information and discussion. So this is on receipt. Do I have a motion, please? I'll move that. Second? I'll second that. Okay. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, carried. Um, that the suggested wording from legal counsel be accepted. Do I have a motion on that, please? I'll move that. Second? I'll second that. Discussion? Councillor Bichette? I just want to thank staff for going ahead and getting legal uh, advice on this. Thank you. Anybody else? Nope. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, carried. And that the Code of Conduct Amendment bylaw be prepared for the February 7, 2023 regular council meeting. Do I have a motion, please? I'll move that. Second? I'll second that. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, motion is carried. Um, housing Needs Report 2022. The Council receive and discuss and approve the Housing Needs Report for December, pardon me, report December 2022. Do I have a motion, please? I'll move that. Second? I'll second that. Thank you. Discussion? Councillor Burchette? Yeah, I noticed an error here again. Um, Page 39, table 16. Um, these are important statistics, so we should make sure we get them right. Um, under the currently occupied available, uh, on the, the only apartment in Sayward, uh, it says that it's 25 rooms. It's actually 32. Okay, so you can bring that up with the CAO tomorrow and they can contact. Sorry, CAO. 
Your microphone, please. I'm, I'm oh, sorry. After the meeting. Here, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what I was going to suggest, uh, Mr. Mayor, if, if if it's agreeable to work our way through these, it might allow us to actually um, accept the report tonight versus working through it afterwards and then having to bring the entire report back to council again. So if it's if it's a couple of suggestions and it's easy to note uh, very well, just just for efficiency. I agree. I would generally wait till after the meeting. And we're, sorry, we sorry. got it. We, we, we We've already, already got it. it. OK. Any other further discussion? Councillor Tinsley. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, it's an excellent report. It, it's interesting that some of it is similar to the other planning report before this, which is fine. It's all the same statistics, but a, a very interesting connection here. One of the things it's emphasized is um, the partisan, uh, participation potentially of nonprofits in in the affordable housing sector and working with the community. And I guess I'm just relating this back to further considerations around the uh, letter from the Sacred Future Society, uh, one of the few nonprofits here. Um, that that's um, an interesting fit that could work for us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one of the things, as I mentioned before, regarding this report, this report was done, correct me if I'm wrong, by Urban Systems in order to go for the OCP because it was lacking on the uh, original OCP, correct? Okay, but what's very important for all of council to keep referring to this, and we should have this in the council mayor office, is it shows the numbers of the people that we live here with and who we govern and how many are on that fixed income. Right, so this is excellent material to keep referring back to. Thank you. So all in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, motion is carried. Public nuisance bylaw. The council received the public nuisance bylaw staff report for information and discussion. Motion, please. I'll move that. Second. I'll second that. Since this is on receipt, we're just receiving that. So all in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, it's receipt. And that staff be directed to bring back a draft of the public nuisance bylaw for February 7, 2023 for the council meeting for council review. Can I have a motion, please? I'm with that. Second? I'll second that. Discussion. I think one of the things that we should also be looking at is some of the suggestions in terms of how to keep, how to mitigate the noise in terms of um, inexpensive shelters or covers for it should be part of that staff report coming back. And I do disagree with, um, we have a little bit more unique situation here than major municipalities do. TASIS has the same problem that we do, so does the ballast and everything else. But to mitigate the noise, I don't see any issues with that. For us to look at different ways and options that we could explore before we pass the bylaw. Councillor Dinsley. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And in regards to further discussion, it, it is an interesting point relative to the core village. Uh, we are very similar to large me metropolitan areas. Uh, and we also are in, uh, how can I describe this, trying to encourage people who want to live in that environment. They want their sewer, they want their water. Um, yes, we're surrounded by trees, but um, we're very similar in terms of the uh, the issues there. So I personally think that in terms of value of real estate, um, people moving to the community, um, having similar types of uh, bylaws is, is, a, is a real consideration, so we'll have further debate on it as we go down the road. Thank you. As we will. OK, that was part of this Councillor Bichette. Yeah, I'd also like to uh, encourage uh, people out there in Sabre to uh, use the app and, and, and check the decibel levels of generators just so you can get an idea of uh, levels and uh, talk with your neighbors and, and, and work something out. And, uh, you know, it's a, a great community. It'd be nice to see people work together and, and find a solution without it going to bylaw. So I would encourage that as well. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? 
No. Nope. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, motion is carried. Emergency Services, Public Work, Recreation, Department Reports. Emergency Service Update by Councillor Tom Tinsley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the report's fairly straightforward here. Uh, an update since I think it was about a couple of months ago. Lots of activities going on. We have a family radio services uh, uh, net going uh, that's been publicized in the local paper. Uh, something that we're uh, starting and hopefully will line up with other communities that are using those radios as additional emergency backup. Uh, I won't go through all the other reports uh, or the other factors on here. Um, they're pretty straightforward. Uh, one additional to the report is that we now have confirmation of the materials being available for the additional large, uh, newer, uh, larger, more uh, more and better, uh, better uh, antenna that will be going on top of the building relative to ham transmissions from this location. Uh, and so uh, bottom line is lots of activity going on in the emergency services area, and we will continue to report back on that. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. The council received, discussed, and they approved the emergency service update report. We'll get you during discussion. Yeah, sorry. Okay, that's okay. Motion, please. I'll move that. Second. I'll second that. Discussion. Councillor Bouchette. Uh, further to uh, Councillor Tinsley's report, uh, we will be taking the drone out tomorrow and testing it out. So, uh, Hopefully, if the weather cooperates and the wind's down, we'll be doing that at the field. Okay, so no sunbathing in the backyard. I wasn't going to finish that statement. See, I'm getting better. Okay. Okay, so any other further discussion? No? All in favor? Opposed? And motion is carried. Bylaws, the revenue anticipation bylaw 493, that the revenue anticipation bylaw 493 2023 be given first, second, and third reading. Do I have a motion, please? I'll move that. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Discussion? I hear crickets. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, motion is carried. The renumeration bylaw, amendment bylaw 494 be given first, second, and third reading. Motion, please. I'll move that. Second. I'll second that. Discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, carried. New business. We have none. We have some. CAO. Somebody's mic is on. Councillor Tinsley. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to suggest that we revisit item 11B uh, on the agenda. Um, Councillor Bichette made a suggestion that um, there might be a couple of amendments needed to the report. And uh, we actually held off on council approving that report in anticipation of said changes. And I might just suggest that um, that perhaps you approve the demographics report uh, on on the basis or um, on on the basis that uh, staff will receive the suggested amendments, verify them, and. Um, and confirm that in fact they take place and that you approve the report tonight it again similar to the housing needs report it'll save us having to okay. photocopy this report and bring it forward to council again okay so council received discuss and approve the demographics land base report december 2022 with the staff doing some minor changes to the report without changing the entire report and recopying the entire report, 100 and some odd pages, 500 times. Does that pretty well cover it? We'll summarize that. Okay, thanks. All in favor, or pardon me, motion please. I will move that. Second. I'll second it. 
discussion. All in favor? Opposed? So none. Motion is carried. Oops, sorry. Uh, public question period. For the purpose of public question period, is it able? Sorry. So, oh, I'm sorry. CAO France? I'm sorry. We had uh, two items. Um, nobody else knows this one, but I thought I would just take the opportunity to say thank you. Uh, this is my last meeting with you, and, and uh, I, I really truly mean it when I say I've enjoyed working with you. You're a good group, um, and you've got great staff. So I think you've got some really good things happening here. And say, where does for all my talk about retiring for the fourth time? Uh, I guess. I think this is the fourth. Yeah. Oh, I thought you meant how many times you talked about. It. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that was just talk and funning around. The bottom line is that, you know what, in some strange way, I'll miss you all and, and I wish you all the best. And again, thanks very much for bringing me back to help you out. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank you. Well, I guess it's an appropriate time to uh, thank Mr. France for coming out of semi-retirement and uh, and spending these last few months with us and, and helping. Um, I know that um, I, I've actually enjoyed working with you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been good and I do appreciate everything that you've done. Thank you. Question period. For the purpose of question period, is it able to citizens to be able to ask questions at the council about issues that are important to the citizen asking the question? Speakers are asked to limit their questions to one, and if time permits, everyone will have an opportunity to ask a second question. Citizens will be asked to state their name and address and have two minutes total time. Thank you. Do we have anybody? Please come on up and state your name and address and height for the mic, for the microphone. Hi, is it on? Yes. Hi, my name's Janet Bruce. I live at 410 McMillan Drive, right next to Mr. Nielsen. When we put our generator in, I did a lot of research regarding decibels, noise, and mine, I spent a lot of money on it. It's certified, it's within the range, and never once did Mr. or Mrs. Nielsen come to speak to me about the noise. And I want to know why. Okay, but this is not the place. Question. It's not a question to us. Your your question is to the other presenter. So I would suggest, with all due respect, that after the meeting, that you and uh, Mr. Nielsen have a conversation regarding that, because honestly, Mrs. Bruce, that is not for us. Like we don't have any control on that. So, so if you could please speak to Mr. Nielsen about that yep. and and that's where that conversation would probably be best served. Yes, I just want you to know it's within the decibel range. Of okay, area. thank you very much. Anyone else? Sir? I'm Mike McMillan, so I'm across the road from Mr. Nielsen. Um, I would just like to ask you, know, have you guys researched what the decibel levels sound like? Like, you know, you know what a normal conversation that two people would have in a, in a closed room would be at? Do you know what two people talking in the street would be at? I think if you look into that, um, you know, you will find that 40 is very low. Um, you know, it's a little above, above a whisper. Um, you know, I think conversations are generally you know, up very bit higher than that, but I'd just like to ask if you guys have looked into that. Um, also, you know, testing with an app is, you know, if it's a curiosity, that's one thing, but if it's enforcing bylaw, that might be something else. That's my comment. 
Agreed. Um, one of the things that will happen when the staff report comes back, it's going to recognize a lot of the wants and, and what the proper equipment is to do the testing because we're, we're not going to definitely enforce something from our personal phone because one phone could be different from another. Yep. So that's something that the staff has been instructed to look into. Thank you. But thank you. Anybody else? Council look into uh, the uh, validity passing by law because there is no other example of a bylaw like this anywhere in Western Canada. Large municipality, small municipality, medium sized municipality. So if you're considering doing something that nobody else is doing, I would check with my legal counsel. Thank you. Okay. So we are going to go in camera. Relax. You're not there yet. And sit down. We're not done. That in accordance with Section 92 of the Community Charter, this council meeting will be closed to the public at this time in order for council may can give consideration to matters in accordance with the following sections of the Community Charter, which will be 90-1K. Do I have a motion, please? I'll move that. Second? I'll second that. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, motion is carried. 17, adjournment. We will.